Rain it. Rain it. Yeah. yeah. So like right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Liesel. Hi, I'm Liesel Testament. Nice, nice to meet you. Billy. These women are representatives of the Kohler Foundation. They are meeting with Billy Tripp, who will be showing them around the property they will be inheriting upon his death. Property which includes his massive steel sculpture, the minefield, which the foundation will work to preserve according to Billy's wishes. I think it's important that you leave all of the things that, that you wish could happen and want to happen. We'll make it, we'll figure the complexity of it out. Well, I don't think it's going to be moved. No, I don't either. Not I don't either. Either. But, yeah. but there may be a way, you know, there may be a local steward who wants maybe some of your art to be on their location and that ties the two places together. There's, if we have that kind of flexibility and we know yeah, that I it's... I don't like the idea of being scattered. Okay. But okay. I mean, if that's the only way y'all can do to no. raise money or something. No, no, do... we would never sell them for money. No, we, we don't raise money. money. Well, what are you, what's your impression of it? I mean, <laughs> I, think, I, it's, I, I been, think it's pretty spectacular. I haven't been to Watts Tower, but I'll, I like what I've seen of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it on its way to becoming kind of like that? Oh, yeah. This is, uh, oh. Yes, this is a very important art environment. People mm -hmm. are, this is. It's a beloved site in the art world, absolutely. And I've told Rambo's like, you know, it is kind of an oddball thing, you know, but the more a community or a family can accept the oddities in their family or community or mm -hmm. the eccentric, you know, the better it is. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to by four of you. My name is Randall Kendrick. I was born in Brownsville, Tennessee, the home of the minefield. Growing up in Brownsville, the minefield was an oddball feature of the small town and its creator was a mysterious man who I only knew of through urban legends and town gossip. A few years ago, I became fascinated with this sculpture. I could find very little information about it despite its 30 years of history, and the existence of it and its creator was rarely acknowledged outside of Brownsville. So I decided to make this documentary to uncover the secrets of this massive piece of art and learn about the person who made it. I don't have money, experience, professional equipment, or a crew, but I do have the determination to see this project through to the end. So if you're watching this, then hopefully you'll find that was enough. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> Did it startle you? Yeah. So tell us who you are and, and My what you have. My name is uh, William Blevins Tripp. And uh, nobody knows me by that name. And uh, they know me by Billy Trip, okay. which I really like. <laughs> uh, I started my minefield in 1989 and have been working on it as much as I can ever since. What you see today is uh, the result of that and a lot of playing around and sitting around and thinking about it. This is one of the few art exhibits that have been composed by one person and one person only. The only help Billy has, has had is the concrete footings that have been, were poured by a local contractor here. Every exhibit that you see was brought here from, from another location, was disassembled by Billy, was reassembled and whatever remedial work had to be done. So he's a one man show. top to the fire tower. He had the crane and he was had the fire tower, the, the top of it swinging and he's just up there trying to grab it and set it down and we were like just horrified because we kept thinking he's gonna, it's gonna, it's too heavy. It's, it, it made us, I mean we were waiting for him to just. As long as one is growing there's always a newness around in that which one is growing into. So you may have that type of uh, higher level of concern or awareness about safety. But as far as just generally working in the minefield and working with my equipment, 
I'm pretty comfortable. Remember I said the first time up anything new. <laughs> The work he does, he's very much in control when he's working. And he plans everything in a very detailed way in his journals and in his mind. You know, he wants everything set up. If he's going to paint, he wants the sprayer set up just so the paint's there. All the tools he needs, his mask, his clothes, everything's there. He sets himself up for success. Billy is an extremely good welder. My father always said that it was an art to do exactly what he does. The uniformity of bead that he draws. That my dad always said he was the best welder he ever saw. Billy come wandering in and I could see he was kind of a cool dude and he let it be known that he was, uh, I guess, somewhat of an artist and uh, that he was interested in taking the tire down and reconstructing it. Shortly after I had sold it to him, I drove by there one day and, and almost regretted doing so because I looked up and he had a rope tied from the very top of the center of the tire around his waist, around a harness, and he was halfway on the side of the globe with a cutting torch, cutting pieces out, and I thought, oh my gosh, I've sold him that, and now he's gonna get killed on it. I sort of half-heartedly regretted selling it to him, but I didn't realize how talented Billy was. He, t he took it down piece by piece. He would put them on a, on a truck, and he traveled at night to Brownsville to take those pieces. Got them all down there, and somehow figured out how to put them all back up. That's where the edge of the burner would be. And, uh... That would be one edge and that brick, uh, that, that brick right here. During my time with Billy, I had the privilege of watching him construct the next large piece in the minefield, a 40-foot tall wood burner salvaged from Selmer, Tennessee. Figured it, you know, and I knew I have 14 of those. So how many, 14 of that many lengths around the perimeter, you know, that would be the circumference. And we'll see. same homeroom and I've been knowing him ever since you know for a long time we graduated together in 73. Anthony Turner Billy's longtime friend runs a barber shop and museum directly in front of the minefield in addition to showcasing Billy's art the museum is dedicated to various other subjects such as racial equality and musical artists like Elvis Presley but as a barber I've been in this place for about 31 years and the museum part came later and I decided to Opened up a museum because people always wanted to bring me some type of gift. And I had in mind that one of these days, 
I'm going to build this wonderful kind museum from people all over the world. So that's what I did. Hey, you see that word up top? It say begin, B-E-G-I-N. You see those two urns on the side? That's where he was originally supposed to be buried. Really? Uh-huh. His actress was supposed to be placed in those two urns. Wow. Yes. So has that changed? That have changed. I think he got permission from the city now to be buried in the ground directly underneath the canoe. You see the canoe on top? Anthony also gives guided tours of the minefield for those who come from far and wide to experience the sculpture. So I looked it up last night. I said, you know, Brownsville, big sculptures, and we found it. It's unlike anything that you've seen before, so it's, it's very intriguing and draws you in. It looks very dystopian in a way when you first see it, uh, which, I, which I really like. I, I think of probabilities. A small town like this has maybe the most unique person that I've ever... I mean, this is, uh, this is incredible. There was an accident on 40, had to divert. Came around the square and I saw one water tower, then I saw a fire tower and then another fire tower and I thought, what is this? So I had to slow down and check it out and that's how I found it. I have to put my feet on these brackets where the steps would normally go, you see? So that's why it takes a half hour to climb up. That and the fact that I'm 54 years old. After discovering the minefield, Ken Heron forged a relationship with Billy through filming him with his drones. Every year, he hosts a meetup for drone enthusiasts, the biggest tourist event at the minefield. Leg action. Yeah. It's very cool. We weren't expecting to see you today. I welded for a moment so I know what you're doing. Yeah, I did. How did you come to have this idea? Well, I was working small in metal stuff and I just had it stored with you. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I just like working with my hands. I'll let them go before I go back out there. Yeah. I'd rather somebody visit and send, leave me a message or send me an email than, you know, I really don't want to talk to people. You know, I'm glad they had a good time. And, and most times they can get, I feel like they can get what they want without me. Despite positive reception by tourists, within Brownsville, Billy's work has sparked a variety of small controversies throughout the years. In the late 2000s, Billy hired a film crew to make It's Still America, a short film documenting the town's mixed reaction to his work. I think the larger and better story of the minefield is the community side to it. 
Uh, most everybody's got an opinion about the minefield. There are some folks in the community who don't think the minefield speaks very well of the community. Some of the artwork, it, it kind of messes with you, if you will, for lack of a better phrase. It teases you. And that's one thing for an adult, but when you've got a six-year-old in the car with you and they want to know what that means, and it's right in the middle of town, it puts you in a situation. When I got a little uncomfortable about it was when he, he threw those Barbie dolls up on the top and painted them green and something about that. But dolls is what they were. And people became very upset because they were nude. I've had a call from a lady who uh, was complaining about it, and, um, and I asked her what her complaints were, and she told me, did I realize that the Barbie dolls on the statue had pierced nipples? And I said, ma'am, I can't hardly tell that they're Barbie dolls. I said, how can you tell that they have pierced nipples? She said, I'm looking at them in binoculars. I said, well, you certainly don't have much to do. Look, they're dolls. You, your, your child plays with stuff like this. And then when I started painting the water tank, I think some people thought I might put something up there that was really inappropriate. I got word of mouth that uh, a petition was being circulated around town trying to get me to stop, you know. It didn't make me mad or anything like that. I wasn't like gonna take action and this is horrible. I just didn't understand it. I didn't know how far he was going to go with that as far as crudeness and it is in the middle of our town and it kind of makes it look like those messages are what Brownsville stands for as a town if you don't know what that is and he would put provocative things on it I'm for gay rights but personally I like women he would put things about Christianity oh I know his truck said Satan saves oh glory I mean how are you going to go put something like that on your truck right in the middle of the Bible Belt? In Haywood County, there's a population somewhere between 18 to 19,000 people. There is somewhere in excess of 100 churches here. And so if you take those two numbers alone, then you know that there are a lot of people here who are deeply religious and very strong in their conviction. If you put a sign in front of them that says Satan saves, you're asking for it. There's not a time when the Satan Saves truck drives through Brownsville that Chamber doesn't get three or four phone calls. Somebody said, Joe, can you not do something about that? I said, no, I can't do nothing about that. I said, you know, it's still America. People would question me as to what he meant by that. And one day I asked him, and I, what, what do you mean by Satan Saves? And he said, it's just a reminder to him personally that there's an alternate view of things in life. So many people were trying to read a whole lot more into it than it really was there. I had a, a very religious fellow tell me one time, he said, look, people have a problem with that, but he said, most folks are saved when they had the hell scared out of them, so I'd say Satan did save them, uh, or pushed them to be saving, so he said, maybe Billy's on to something. There's many ways these people are living right there. Uh huh. And then uh, the thing about ending tribalism down there. Yeah. But the thing that sparked that at the time, I heard that uh, a Methodist a radio broadcast in news uh, saying the Methodist church had defrocked a woman minister for being uh, a lesbian, you know, or for. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Defrocked. And that's where that defrock tribalism part comes in. Oh, okay. You know, and you know, it's like take the take the frock off of thing of just things that initially are just tribal 
attributes, you know. Yeah. Um, take, yeah. take the, you know, the frock, meaning that like the religious cloak that you put on, like, now I am authority, you know. I can speak for God, you know. <laughs> well, take it, you know. Oh, this is dog bless whatever. Now the other side, it says something different, man. Right? It says a dog is an awesome dog. Yeah. <laughs> At the time I heard that so much. You know, same thing with God bless anything. You know. Yeah. It was so generic at the time and that was just my way of dealing with it. I think Billy has an ant antagonistic relationship with anything to do with God or religion and the Satan saves thing was triggered by listening to those radio programs that are, uh, you know, down home gospel, Jesus, hellfire and brimstone sermons that he was listening to that he got caught up in on that trip that he took. Um, and he felt like those people were self-righteous and you know, how dare they tell me what to believe and how to think. And I think that kind of all just meshed with the pain he had been through. And and his response was to put Satan's saves on his truck. Yeah, I believe him when he says it was a reminder not to be self-righteous. But, you know, Billy kind of has a love-hate relationship with the tension. It must have been 30 people on their motorcycles following me down to the fine field. So we go in the back and I'm like, Billy, you know? And he comes out and I said, they want to see your motorcycles. They're on Harley Davidson's going to New Orleans. And he, the garage door was closed and he lifted the garage door and that whole group collectively just went, <gasps> Billy's motorcycle always drew the biggest crowds, I'll say that. Most folks who came, came to see Billy's motorcycle and see what was new on Billy's motorcycle. I see Billy out riding and he's ridden it all over the country. They used to have bike night down on Bill Street, you know, and he'd take his bike, Sylvia, the one that had all the stuff on it. And it I mean, it looked like a bush going down the road. So I think he kind of enjoyed going down there and parking that bike and then he would sit off somewhere and just watch people look at the bike, yeah. Lucifer is the name of this bike, you know. And it's all black, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> even the trailer pulls its name God, see. So, so whoa, 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 what? <laughs> oh my God, sorry, I didn't mean to so trip Lucifer on you. Lucifer pulls God in this. <laughs> the one time he got a ticket over in a neighboring town, which is Jackson, Tennessee, he had found some cards of nude women and he thought that was kind of neat and put them on his, his bike. There was some issue taken with that and they gave him a ticket and he asked me a question whether I thought that was legal, whether he should fight it or not. And I said, Billy, it's going to cost you way too much. You just pay the ticket. Billy has changed a tremendous amount since we were children. In fact, Beth has been really good for Billy. She has introduced him to different aspects of life and different perspectives of, of thinking. When we first started dating, I kind of became concerned about him driving around with that on his tailgate. I was concerned for his safety because all the extremists and whatnot, you know, the, you know, it was frankly, kind of dangerous to be doing that. It was probably okay as long as he was in Brownsville. But, I mean, he took trips out of state in that truck. I was concerned about it. It pretty much came down to, you're going to take that off the tailgate or we're not going to get along very well. <laughs> I think it speaks well of the community. There, there may have been opposition to it, but I never felt that. If I did, it was no more than if I'd, uh, if they didn't like the way I dressed or some, you know, combed my hair or something. It's, it's,
he doesn't feel the criticism like you and I would feel it. He's kind of oblivious to the negativity and the danger that that brought in. You know, he kind of has that naivete about how other people feel and think and what they might do and how he can be hurt. And, you know, he, he really doesn't see that. If I had lived my entire life in Brownsville and remembered what it looked like when I was a kid and remembered driving down those roads and then suddenly this thing emerges, <laughs> it would be disruptive. So I'm not surprised at all that it's gotten <laughs> uh, negative reviews from some folks in town. I'm more surprised by uh, the fact that the city officials have worked with him and, and that it seems maybe it's turning the corner and, and getting normalized as a part of the town. I'll quote one of the professors from Shelby State. I was down there one day and we were talking uh, and he found out I was from Hayward County and he said, oh, that's the, that's the home of the minefield. And I said, yeah, sure is. And he said, one day that will put Hayward County on the map. That was in its infant stages. When construction on the minefield began, the city put a stop work order on it and requested that Billy explain the purpose of his construction. Since then, city officials and local media have embraced his work as an attraction and icon of Brownsville. The state says they had a grant for communities if they wanted to put up, I think they called it Wayfinders sign. It was help tourists find their way around town. They offered money to local communities to make something to go with the signs that they were uh, going to put up. So uh, when our contact person went to them and talked to them about it, she said that uh, she suggested, well, since the minefield was in it, why don't you make them out of metal? When you're in a small town and you're struggling, you try to find anything you can to get tourists to come. And so gradually over the years, you know, the minefield was growing and expanding. And so you say, oh, there's this thing, you can come look at it. It's not like a big city where there's new buildings and structures going up and there's tons of money flowing. And you know, in a small town like ours, it's, it's been pretty quiet. like the Loch Ness Monster, you know, you can't make your own, you, you can't go buy one and, and, and develop a legend about your town and then sell it. People try, places try to do that. I think Brownsville owes him a great debt of gratitude. In recent years, controversy surrounding Billy's work has calmed, and the city's population has grown to accept the minefield. I don't know if acceptance or tolerance is more of the appropriate word for it. Uh, some people still consider it to be uh, a waste of good steel. Some people consider it to be the finest thing that's, that's ever happened in Haywood County. However, when I decided to investigate public opinion on my own, I received a less than definite conclusion. I'm making a documentary about the minefield. Do you have anything to say about it? No, I don't need, I don't, I don't need no more than I do. That sculpture over there, would you, would, would you want to say anything about it? What is to say? They've been there since I was a kid. Yeah? So it's just kind of like here for you. It's just kind of like, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't even know that it's apathy so much as people just don't know and they're just busy in their lives just trying to make it and feed their kids and get their kids through school and 
um, pay the rent. I don't, I don't look at it as that being uh, that special. It's important to me. I'm under no illusion that, that 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 alone makes it important to somebody else. And I don't really care if it's important to somebody else. Other people's importance is for them to make. <laughs> you know how I like to build in uh, stories to my stuff? I was thinking of putting this either you know, I told you these two sites either at the end of the loading dock or the drive-in or back uh, behind the fire tower. And I hadn't come up with a, you know, like the drive-in theater theme is like the loading dock for the ship, you know, so that helps it sit off to one side. And I hadn't come up with an idea for either of these to go with either of these places until recently. I thought of one, if I put it uh, behind the fire tower, well visually I like uh, that it, see the skyline is so high with the fire tower, the end of the ship doesn't need to be that high. So it does kind of help bring it back down. But I thought of a good idea if I put it back there. It's the Terminus Temple. And then maybe you can explain um, just very quickly it's what it's supposed to be. It's oh gosh, don't tell. Uh, well, it had several themes, but yeah. what is it supposed to be? Okay, I have been asked that. What is it supposed to be? Uh, what is it supposed to be? It's a conversation with myself, and even though it is I and life talking only to myself, such as it is, such is enough. And I intend to keep up the conversation, uh, my part of the conversation. And that's what it is. I mean, it's in metal. So, <laughs> what is it? I mean, it's, it's my grave marker, okay? It's my grave, I'm gonna be buried down here. It's my grave. <laughs> what is it, it? What is it, IT, that's what it is, it. You know, you want a long definition, I could give you that. You can read my fucking books, okay? <laughs> Billy gets asked all the time to do presentations about his work to various groups. He, quite frankly, is just very tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And, you know, sometimes I look at these celebrities on television and they go through these interviews and you know they are so tired of being asked about something 5,000 times. And he feels the same way. He, he's. He's like, it's all out there, it's on YouTube, it's in my books, it's everywhere. If you want that story, go read it. It's a uh, memorial to my mom and dad uh, and to the experiences of life. Uh, I know it's weird asking an artist what, his, what, is what, it? The, what yeah. their art is. I mean, what, you want a two second answer? What <laughs> no, is it? No. I think his metal work is just a physical representation of his writing. For most of his life, Billy has written a series of books titled The Mindfield Years. The first volume, The Sycamore Trees, is a fictionalized autobiography that he first wrote when he was in his early 20s. I like, where does one go? When in days of one said, one says not anything of sense, nor anything of sound. You know, because I wanted to write about myself. I was only 18, 19 years old, and you know, I was not technically versed in any field to be able to write with authority. You know, I, not at all about anything other than myself, you know. Smallest of sound of in and of itself gave itself enough meaning to try to talk again. Anyway, I, I, that's, a per, that's one of my favorite chapters, 28. I have a definite memory of hearing the story, probably on the radio, of somebody with multiple personalities. I remember hearing it and thinking, well, I can, ju I can do that. I can make use of that. Instead of saying, well, I did this and I did that, and then I thought this way, and then I said to myself, you know, this, that, and other, I, I, I. If I would give names to 
different aspects of my personality, which I think most people have. Blevins was the more analytical and logical, and Clarence was the more feeling and poetical, maybe. And Blevins was my, is my middle name, you know. So, and Clarence, when I went to high school, we had a little group of people, I guess all people do, all students, but in my little group, our little group, uh, we gave each other's nicknames, you know, just for whatever. And mine was Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> I think at that time he was exploring who he was and what life was about at a very core level. He recognized those different parts of himself as distinct entities. So, you know, if you're going to write a fictional novel, why not just name them and, and give them a space? Billy's childhood bed, as mentioned in the sycamore trees, hangs from the minefield's potted plant. Begin, the first and last word of the book, marks his place of burial. The minefield years volumes three, four, and pre-volume one are journals that Billy has written throughout his life. But originally, every volume continued the story of the sycamore trees. So he's got it aimed at this, the star, and out of the corner of his eye he sees the uh, star, a big star sign, flicker on and off. You know, that's, he, put, he says, I know the answer, and he pulls the trigger. So I probably got through a second or third draft of it and set it aside and, and, and did think of it continuing to another volume. And really, for, uh, for three more. They had a metal bucket that had a plastic top on it with a horse spout. And the poor spout had a lit, had a screw on cap, and I, I, I wanted to warm it up, so I set it up on a small gas heater. And I probably wrote the first draft of those three following, but uh, the paint, the heat must have expanded the paint and popped the top off. See, it was pretty full, and so and then it started uh, coming out a little bit, and it probably dribbled down onto the heater, and caught that a fire. But I had a shop fire that described that destroyed some of it and some of three and four. You know, that that that's probably some of it. I can't I don't have my glasses on. Uh, let's see like that. That's the start of one. Oh I can, man. Yeah, oh it was oh it was such a pretty start. I was good on it says in the spring. Let me get it I'll get my glasses. In the spring of 85, the talent of Billy Perrine began. Billy's series of books documents his many artistic endeavors. He attended art classes at Jackson State and the University of Memphis, as well as six weeks of welding school. In all three cases, he dropped out of school to study the subjects on his own. These self-studies led to endeavors in painting, sculpture, and poetry. That's me and my mom. Uh-huh. Right That's an eight by eight there. Wow. Right there. I don't know. That's one I did with a four inch roller. Mm -hmm. A lot of these, in this, I don't know if you can see it. That's the one without a nose. I've mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Well, all of these really don't have nose as much, do they? Well, that, this one has the senses gone. Oh. To be filled up, you know. Nobody's perfect or ever had a little physical defect. If you want to call it a defect, you see, to begin with. The title is like, Upon the Brink I Stand. You know, it's like on the edge of something. And he's just standing there, you know. That's, that's another one I had to take a picture of. A family, I mentioned that. Uh, mother and father and three boys. Some of my stitch men. You know, this is just like two legs and two arms and backbone or something, you know. They got kind of abstract. There's another one. Billy kept his various metal sculptures in an empty patch of land on his father's property. 
After attaining structural beams, a framework was erected and adorned with his sculptures. This project slowly grew into the minefield. His many early pieces are still frequently incorporated into various parts of the larger sculpture. It's all about an internal story that I think is largely un, unappreciated by people who see the Mind Tower, the, the personal human aspect of it, because it comes off as being kind of steely and uh, industrial and uh, substa you know, electrical substation looking. It's his own personal narrative. It's like his diary, basically. It's really assemblage art, found object assemblage art on a monumental scale. Uh, did I ever tell you the, what goes along with me? Somebody, uh, she helped me to give a speech on the minefield locally, and the guy introduced her as my interpreter. And so below it, it says interpreter. You see? Oh, You're yeah. reading it? Yeah. But I put the N and the second E backwards because in interpretation, you don't quite get the full story. Well, look, she's got one hand back to the minefield and one foot, and the other hand and foot back to the courthouse. So yeah. she's like a go-between. Wow. You know, you know, I like to build little stories into things. That's you know. very clever. And then, of course, he does the MF joke. He thinks that's hilarious, you know. I think it's crude, but, you know. You know, when I lost my virginity, I made one for that. Really? You know, I put her name on there. And, Is uh, that the one that's the triple X? No. Okay. It's, it's kind of opposite on the ditch side. It says, has been my experience. Oh, yeah. okay. So that one's about your virginity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, with those markers of big events in his life where that, you know, something happened that was big enough that he felt like he had to express it or mark it in some way, and some piece of metal came out of that. So that ought to tell you something, that the tallest piece in the minefield and the biggest piece in the minefield are both about his mother and father. get it over there and uh, start putting it up. Putting it up is fun, always fun. And it goes so quick, you know, that. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm glad it goes quick, but uh, we've got to get things set up. put it uh, so this is really more I don't really need this out of the way but while I've got my crane here I'm gonna clean it up it's This was a meat locker originally, around 63 or so, or early 60s, 60, 60, 63. Dad and his brother-in-law started curing hams here. He was a Methodist minister. I think he kind of got into it by accident with his brother-in-law. They just kind of said, let's try this. It was kind of a side business. 
In addition to running a family ham business, Charles Tripp gained significant capital in Brownsville after buying real estate that expanded the property he inherited from his father. I am aware in talking with dad that the Tripp name was very important in Brownsville when I was a young, when I was very young because of his dad, Robert Tripp. Dad did have quite a bit of money, but chose for whatever reason not to spend it. It would have been 15 to 20 years when the Great Depression hit. My dad was very, very conservative on everything. A lot of things didn't get fixed correctly just because didn't want to spend the money to do it. Both our parents, mother and dad, gave us a lot of freedom. At least I can only speak for me. You have to ask Charlotte, freedom. I mean, freedom was there. It's like curfew. What, what is a curfew? <laughs> I said, you never had a curfew? Well, no. You know, we just came in when we felt like it. It's like, <laughs> you know, there's just absolute trust in that family. While he was a minister, his interaction with us did not result in me, uh, and probably my brothers too, thinking of him as a minister. You know, he was a dad first. My use of describing my mental mind field as being church-like, I was conscious of that from the get-go. Well, once it started on taking on dimensions of looking like a structure or building. You know, I, I, I wanted that. And growing up, church was a place that it was taught to me that this is something special. You know, this seemed to be uh, taught or presented to me from the get-go as, man, this is, you know, this has a book written about it. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, fascinating, that he's an atheist, as he says, and yet created this massive work of art that in some way references a cathedral? He set up something on this world <laughs> to, to sort of be his, his afterlife, his legacy, which is, you know, is, is interesting to think about if, if in fact he doesn't uh, think that his consciousness will go on beyond his death. He um, went to church, went to NYF, was in the boys choir. That was emphasized in his upbringing. I won't say he was indoctrinated because I don't think his parents strove for that kind of control, but it was important in their lives. And I think a pivotal point came when his mother died. whatever reason, Billy did not come to Mother's funeral. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, he, he made his peace, he said, prior to. And when my mother died, I hadn't grown enough to really know her that well. I hadn't grown enough to really know my dad that well. It, it was later that I grew uh, to really think much of him. I think a lot of him, you know. And I feel like if I'd had that time as well with my mother, I, I probably would have grown into liking her uh, just as well. Kind of distances himself from his mother and uses the outlet of saying, uh, I didn't know her very well. Well, you know, yes and no. You didn't know her adult to adult, maybe, but you knew her as your mother. I think something shifted in him when he lost his mother. 
that made him question his relationship with God and with religion. And uh, I think it was a much more painful loss than he is maybe aware of. But his relationship with God and religion changed sometime around that point. I mean, I don't believe in, in we said this before, you know, quote unquote, a God. Mm -hmm. And there may be, you know, but it's still I, until I see and convinced of it or see evidence of it, you know, but it's not really necessary for me to continue with the rest of my life. Similarly, I don't believe in quote unquote ghosts. Mm -hmm. There may very well be, you know, this other dimension, you know, that they're around us all the time, mm -hmm. you know. But until I see evidence of it or am exposed to it, well, I'm not gonna give any more credence to it. Billy became extremely close with Dad in dad's latter days. You know, there there were times when, uh, it's in one of my books, maybe in what I'm writing, we were eating out and uh, he got to talking with the waitress and somehow it resulted, in, it resulted in him having the silly giggles. And you know, that was just so, <laughs> that was so nice to see. <laughs> <laughs> I grew to think of him as my best friend. Dad and Billy depended on companionship they, it, for, from each other. That was, that was, they were always together or they would go out and eat together. It was very hard on him when Dad died. He was pretty directionless and uh, he had kind of withdrawn from the world. His father was Billy's social inlet, going places and doing things with him. And without his father, he had just kind of retreated more and more into his own little physical world and mental world. And I'd heard that people had postponed uh, coming to terms with the death of a loved one and had gotten through it. So I said, well, that's what I'll do. I'll just do it another time. And that allowed me to take the tank down and I went up to Kentucky and took it down and brought it home. And I, I went at it thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to use the time frame of putting my, the tank up uh, to deal with my dad's death. And when I get done with the tank, that's yet. I'm not going to, you know, revisit this uh, death in the family again. You know, I don't want to do it forever. The tallest piece down here in my work is a large beam. It goes up maybe uh, 125 feet. And I call it my dad's grave marker. Down at the bottom of it, I have uh, some words cut out that say, is and, and, so now, Billy, begin your life without him. I was stuttering uh, to begin my life without him, so I was sort of tripping over the first part of it. I did tell me, see, I, I, uh, I had Dina, but I hadn't put, her in, put it up when I bought that, so that kind of gave me something to do mm -hmm. at, right after my dad died, when I wasn't really ready to start the journal about it. And um, I didn't know I was going to start a journal again, but, but I had a lot of pictures, of my, several pictures of my dad on there. I had his wedding ring on there. When Billy said he was building that tower to process the grief, all of a sudden I realized this is not some tacky statue. This is an incredible love letter from a son to his parents. In 1981, Billy's father gave him a car wash to own and operate. And after Billy retired from performing public welding services in the early 90s, the car wash served as his main source of income for many years while building the minefield. After his father's death, he inherited the land that included his shop and the minefield. 
as well as several rental properties. His rentals are now his main source of income after giving his car wash over to Anthony Turner in 2020. This is what you call the mind field guard. Oh, wow. I built this in honor of his mother and dad. His dad was so good to me, so I wanted to do something that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, to do something for me. So I run the car wash now. That's the historic car wash. When I remodeled it, everything I took off of there, I used it to build a monument leading up to the mind field guard. So everything you see here came off the car wash. that I can step off of some place, say in the minefield, step off and just be suspended. You know, I won't fall to the ground. And it, it recurs enough that I, I don't have any doubt about it anymore. You know, in my dreams, you know. came to works of William Lee's Tate Moon during the time I was putting up my water tank. Not long after that, my brother, older brother Charlie shows up, who's a pilot, and has a plane and says, would you like to fly with me to Lincoln, Nebraska? Well, oh, sure, that's a vacation for me. And besides, it'll bring me back to Columbia, Missouri, where Heat Moon lives, and I'll just, I'll just make up a little letter or something tell him about me and my books and my work and look up this uh, restaurant this tavern and ask if this guy heat moon ever comes through there again and if he do, which i did and if he does i'll say say will you give him this letter for me and so that's the way it happened i gave him the Mo owner or manager who I met there, this letter. And evidently he gave it to Heat Moon and Heat Moon wrote me back. And so that's how we met. So I ended up asking Heat Moon 
about something that I thought about since then. I said, well, what happened to that canoe that was in the book? Because it was metal. He was glad for me to get it, you know, and uh, put it up in my minefield. And uh, once I did that, I kind of used it as a way of strengthening what a theme that was already in place and beginning to grow of my work being, my minefield being like a ship. Or maybe the ship leaving for the next life. The canoe is like under the begin word, you know, like a sunset circle thing. Well, it terminates the ship, but it's like the temple, you know, like a last temple or something. And uh, although the man sitting on a bench, who could be like the king or something who's died, he is still facing the rear of the ship. He hadn't quite turned around to it. I take the why off economy and make store, stores into s story. The coal one story. I have the metal minefield and then the minefield books in English. So they're two stores. So it's they're both they they're co, but it's still just one story. I I don't know if it makes sense, but that's what I was thinking. If I hung it somewhere down there. This motel sign, uh, this uh, Delta Heritage sign, that's where it came from. You know that uh, right there? And that pole, you know? I think we'll look good between the two fire tunnels. I'm thinking of putting something out like this. Hmm. You know, like I have a pipe through what's there. And then I can hang something down here. Uh, but. Something that won't catch a lot of wind, though. The cement silo that the guy, the man sitting on a bench sits on, pipes going through them on the end of them. They have like urns on it. And this is like a, a mirrors a similar shape. It's just a little bigger urn, which kind of mirrors the pot, you know, uh, the cement mixer. But that's what these are. That's, that's my idea for using them if I ever get them. Oh, I have those uh, LP tanks out there. You know, they're like this. Mm -hmm. You know, with a round thing. And and what I'm thinking I'm going to do is maybe cut it right here, like that. And it's some like a, it looks like a canoe now. Mm -hmm. And maybe put a a, ma a sail mast on it. You know. But see that would I take this off, you know it will be. You follow me? You follow what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah. And I'm think I have like maybe ten of them, and if I put five of them on each side like a ship does with lifeboats, you know they're just kind of hanging on each side. That's my idea for those. Oh. You mentioned lifeboat. 
you know. So I, but I was thinking of maybe putting a mast stuck in it, you know, uh, and maybe a sail. I don't know, but. <coughs> Hope I get around to it. I'm gonna run out of time. And this is just what I have to work with and stop. I've got enough. I don't. I don't want to get any more. <laughs> I yeah. don't have room. I need to. You know. Just, yeah, it, lo it, lo it looks like you've got enough to got enough. be build building for a while. Yeah. I certainly don't want any more of this sort of stuff. But if it's something that's odd, you know, uh, you know. But still, I don't want it. I got enough. Mm -hmm. Welcome. County farm water tank, you know which one that is? That's the one in the, the one in front of Dina. Yeah. Or the one in front of the seed yeah, house. That I put a grain bin with on. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that in notebook one of the unsholty of the minefield notes. I'm thinking about what sort of structures I'd like to get. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, that tank was one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, but I didn't get it to here at the last, and, it's, and I think I was, it was the last thing I wanted to get, you know. And it ended up being the last thing I got. I'd already gotten this. This is my wheel. And then it says, I hereby will devise and bequeath unto the Kohler Foundation its successors assigns hereafter referred to as Kohler Foundation. Located in Kohler, yada yada. I do like the idea of, it, of trying to keep as much of it together, even my paintings, mm -hmm. if you can. I've kept, I have sold, I've never sold any to begin with, and have given away very few, so everything I've all ever done is still together. Okay. I think it's important that you leave all of the things that, that you wish could happen and want to happen. We'll make it, we'll figure the complexity of it out. Well, don't you think it's better if it's local or it's not, maybe? But art environments have such a, a sense of place. Uh -huh. They're built in a place that <clears throat> is, is usually from that place. So I think we really think there's strength and, I, I don't know, emotion attached to the place they were built. It'd be neat uh, if, since I have my shop over here, and uh, where the where y'all parked, and then that garage, it's a five. It's a good size building. You know? I said I could see people maybe taking it. I don't know if internship is the right word, mm -hmm. but you know maybe uh, paying to uh, 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 work in my shop or in that shop or something. You know, like some sort of whatever, mm -hmm. you know, art related. Artist in residence that could be constructed into, you could have an artist in residence space in your shop and yep. then they, we could create yeah. a space for them to live while yeah, they're well, here. I used to live here before. Right, I right. Here. 
Yeah. And so those in, those inter that's right internship fellowship yeah. they'll come do maintenance work according to the maintenance plan and keep up yeah. the site itself. So you're thinking about it exactly about having, how we like think about paying it. students or something. Yeah, that would yeah. Do it, you know. I don't know, way over, do their own artwork. Yep. Yeah. You know? yep. Well, yeah. it's also yeah. a great place for students to come learn about documentation and yep. museum studies and, mm -hmm. you know, um, all, all of those aspects. So. And one other thing, I might think of something else, but uh, I'm 66, so in nine years, I'm going to be 75. Now, if I do live to be 80 or more, there's going to come a time when I'm not going to work on the minefield anymore. Mm -hmm. And it may be 75, which is only nine years later. Mm -hmm. And if I, 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 I'm sure it's 75, if not sooner, I'm going to seriously think about uh, not doing that anymore. I have other things I want to do. I want to finish my writing, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but if I do say, in nine years decide not to work on it anymore. I'd be willing uh, to give y'all the minefield and this just so y'all can start mm -hmm. get you know, not have because it's just gonna sit around until I die. Right. You know, so y'all can maybe start on it. So I don't I don't know if I would give you the rest of my estate. But sure. would y'all be open to that? Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. uh it's kind of sometimes it's kind of nice because then the conservators have you as a resource, mm -hmm. you know, to to talk to about this or that, um, you know. So that's kind of neat when we yeah. get to work, you know, with living artists. So. I just I'd like for it to be maintained. Yeah. And 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 uh, I'd like for it to be uh, maintained just to be there for. Uh, if somebody else wanted to make, wanted to uh, read the book, you know, like a book, mm -hmm. it's there, it's mm -hmm. done, it's there. So if you want to read the book, then it's there, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and but that's you know, that's up to y'all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, yeah, that's good. And I think yeah. Lisa alluded to that earlier that we don't often get to work with the artists who built. The, the structure uh -huh. or the environment. Uh -huh. A lot of times they've already passed on or their family's trying to figure out what to do. So the, the fact that you're already thinking about it and we get to have this yeah. this conversation is amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. It really does help. Mm -hmm. Here's the card from my lawyers. For my, okay, great. My, Billy's relatively young, as oddly enough, as uh, outsider artists go. And he's actually quite young. He's one of the youngest. Almost all of the art environment people, I'm trying to think who would be an exception, are at least Billy's age or older or dead. And uh, there just does not seem to be very many, uh, hardly any, coming along. You know, the old cliche is that some guy worked in a factory you know, retired at the age of 65 and he wakes up one morning and says, oh, I got nothing to do. I might as well build a dinosaur in the backyard. Right. And then so they, so they start at retirement age. And then by the time you find out about them, they're like in their 80s, you know, or whatever. And um, so there's a demographic tendency for those kinds of artists to be older. Billy's, I think the minefield is the only one now where the artist is still alive that's of that scale. If we're talking, you know, just sheer scale. You know, Billy had the advantage that he didn't have to wait until he was in his mid-60s. Yeah, he had the financial means that he could work on this and get started on this at a much younger age than typically happens. I, you know, I feel like I'm here documenting this stuff sort of at the end of the era. Uh, you know, not to say again that there's a hard and fast ending where all of a sudden there's none. 
but I, you know, like a fading, uh, uh, sort of a fading, culturally fading uh, phenomenon. Working like that, don't you know that the words that just keep popping up in my head are artist and studio? Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, it's like, is this what artists do? <laughs> I know it is, but some of them, but I mean. I never like calling my stuff art or where I work a studio, uh, but it, it, it very well may uh, be appropriately described that way, but that's not the way I think of them, and uh, I don't see that in them. Uh, it's a, it's a, my, my shop is a shop, you know, and my work is just, uh, it's a, you know, conversation with myself and custom made things, you know. But it may have an art aspect about it, but I might call it like a holy aspect or a special aspect. But that art, philosophy stuff, that, those are the terms I use. The world sort of teaches us what art is with a capital A, and very often, those things that are that are folk arts or outsider arts don't fit there and some artists in the folk tradition or in the outsider tradition become comfortable uh, with the word art and artists and some don't Billy doesn't talk about this but Billy has autism and it runs in his family and if you filter what he does through that lens, it helps you understand a lot about Billy. You know, that's what allows him to have such incredible focus because he is so focused. And anybody that has written in a journal every day for 30, 40 years has to have focus. During the spring, summer, and fall, Billy works every day, even on weekends and holidays. In the winter, he edits his journals for publication. I think he's kind of disappointed in his physical decline. You know, he wants to work like he's your age. <laughs> when he was young, he was you know, he was up every morning at 4, 30, 5 o'clock. He'd work till 10 or 11 o'clock at night um, and sleep and eat in between there and get up and do it all again seven days a week, you know. And his body now, even though he's in excellent condition, you know, uh, you, you just, you can't help but slow down some. And I think that bothers him that his his body will not keep up with what he thinks he ought to be able to do. If he can't perform like he thinks he ought to be able to perform, if he can't have that success, then it's gonna become a failure in his mind. And when it becomes a failure, he's gonna walk away from it. It kind of shocked me when he stopped working at the car wash and rented that out because that had been a big piece of his life. Change and transition are difficult for everybody, but for somebody on the spectrum, transition is a, a big deal. I mean, just everyday transition, you know, not to mention big transitions. He creates a world around him that's safe and very predictable and there's not much transition. For him, the more stability there is in his world, the better. 
Well, I think he'll stop working on the metal when he dies, to be honest with you, because I don't, I don't foresee Billy stopping uh, until his death. I'm not 100% convinced that Billy will stop working on the metal until he's unable to work on the metal. He will be lost without some form of metal work in his life. And I, I just don't know that he will give that up. But now he may get to that point in his head um, that he wants to do that. And if, if he gets there, he won't turn back. There were several people who expressed doubt that you would ever stop working on the minefield. What are your thoughts on that? I don't really know. I don't know what I'll do. Other than if my head's still together, I'll work on my book. But, uh, I don't know. I just don't know. If I do stop working on the minefield, I... I have enough of the journal to keep me busy, but I don't think I could probably healthfully write year-round. I'd probably still need a break from it to do something else. And uh, I don't know what that would be. I might just uh, be more of what my wife might call a traditional husband, you know. It might be the opportunity to do that. You know. Billy Preen, in a love which had become serious, mulled through the work with no signs that any of it would survive, with signs that none of it would, and would remain as and remind him of, in general, the body of Ned's work, and in particular, the work of Ned's diary, both uncared over, both unfinished, and completely left. Left, Clarence's book of poems, left Ned's first and second novels, left the battlefield insanities, and left the Diaries of Decision. See, the Diaries of Decision uh, was the subtitle to the second volume. We are. <laughs> so if you want to, uh, it, it take me 30, 40 minutes to get ready. But so if you want to take your pictures of what I've done mm -hmm. or something now, it Where may be too hot. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I uh, don't see this work step of what I'm calling Terminus Temple as existing in a vacuum, then it's more easy for me to see and to appreciate other things that are going on because I'd like to think that other things that happen while I'm putting this up, if they were not important, 
I wouldn't even have them in my life. So I had something to come up and we made a deal for something. And it's for something that I've always, for a very long time, have wanted to put in the mind for. And I never could find. So I bought something. It's a windmill. It made me put it behind the Temple Terminus, which I never thought of going for. But it's like the end of the ship, it could be like the propeller or I like the direction, at least it points the ship in the right way. <laughs> please, look kind of impressive, don't you? Just stand right here beside me. All right, let's get both of us in the picture. I can't see it, but anyway. All right, I, I see it, you're in it. You can smile or nod or whatever you want to do. All right. Oh. 